All right, welcome everybody to our program today, Can American Democracy Survive? An International Perspective with Dr. Fiona Hill of the Brookings Institution. I'm Laurel Plimier and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Piedmont, California. And as always, I wanna thank you all for taking some time out of your day to spend with us here today on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, this event is part of a larger Defending Democracy speaker series, and we're fortunate to have a number of local leagues who are from across the country and are co-sponsoring this series with us. In Colorado, our co-sponsors are Gunnison Valley, the Pikes Peak region, and Pueblo. In California, we have Oakland, Santa Barbara, and Solano County. And then we also have Collier County, Florida, and Portland, Oregon. So we really appreciate your support, support as co-sponsors and welcome to all of the members and guests of those leagues who are uh, joining us here today. And um, based on our registrations, we have 39 different local leagues from 12 different states uh, registered for this event. So it's very exciting for us. Um, you may have seen um, for our first three events in this Defending Democracy series, we had events on voting rights, ranked choice voting, and uh, election law in the Supreme Court. And if you haven't had a chance to, to watch those events, you can find recordings of them on our YouTube channel, and um, there are links to them on our website, which is lwvpmont.org. We have two additional events after today coming up in this Defending Democracy series, um, how disinformation undermines fair elections and what can be done with Rick Hassan on April 5th, and then a more California-centered event on getting out the vote in the Central Valley with Fonda Kerlitz and Shannon Edwards, who are with Central Valley Matters, and that will be on April 27th. So you can find more information about all of those events, past, present, and future, on our website, lwvpmont.org. Um, before we get to the introduction of today's guests, I want to go over a few logistics, which I always do. Um, I expect many or most, maybe even all of you are familiar with the Zoom webinar features. So if you're on the Zoom call with us, you can post questions now or anytime during the presentation using the Q&A feature. Um, and you can use chat, feel free to use chat to introduce yourselves, say hello to each other, shout out where you're coming from. Um, but if you have questions, put them in the Q&A so we can be sure to catch them. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube live stream, you can also post your questions there in the live chat. And if you are joining us on YouTube or watching the recording later, uh, please subscribe to our channel. And if you click the bell, you'll get notifications of our future live stream events. And for advance notice of future events, please join our mailing list, which you can do on our website lwvpmont.org. And you can also become a member of the league there. And when you join the league, your dues alone support our grassroots efforts, both locally and at the state and national levels. So um, if you go to any of the event pages on our website for these Defending Democracy uh, events, you'll see the logos of all of our co-sponsor leagues, and you can click on a league that's near you. Um, and you will be taken to their website and you can join um, your local league directly. And you can also find a local league uh, by going to lwv.org. And there is a specific link to do that, which will be in the recording of the video. And I will hopefully get someone to post it in chat also. <laughs> um, the league efforts in voter education and advocacy are extremely important work and we really appreciate your support. Uh, so, now that we have all those details behind us, let me introduce our guest today. Dr. Fiona Hill is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and she's a member of the Council on Foreign Rela Relations. Her most recent book, There's Nothing for You Here, which I have um, over my shoulder, gives, among other things, both a local and global perspective of the negative impacts on workers in and communities when the main industry in their area leaves them behind. 
She has worked on intelligence under three different presidents, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump. And many of you may remember her from her 2019 testimony in front of the House Intelligence Committee as part of their impeachment inquiry. She is the co-author of two books on Russia, Mr. Putin and The Siberian Curse. And Dr. Hill has degrees from Harvard University and St. Andrews University in Scotland with a focus on Russia and the Soviet Union. So for those of you who have joined our previous events today, we're gonna to do things a little bit differently. Uh, we have some pre prepared questions that I'll start off start off with. And then um, if you post your questions in Q&A, we'll turn to those in the second half of the program. We plan to cover some of the topics that Dr. Hill writes about in her book, including uh, those negative impacts on workers and communities that I mentioned earlier. And we'll then spend some time talking about the influence of Russia on American democracy. And then we'll turn to Putin, Russia, and the war on Ukraine, which I'm sure people are very interested to hear about. So welcome, Dr. Fiona Hill. We had no idea when we originally scheduled this um, yeah. talk to speak with you in late 2021, um, that we would now be a month into a, a war on Ukraine. And um, we're, we know the demands on your time must be great right now. And we really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us. Well, I'm really pleased to be here. And yes, you were very prescient. <laughs> you set this up uh, so many months ago. I mean, absolutely, we couldn't have imagined uh, where we'd be today. That's true. I want to start start with some of the topics that you cover in your book. Um, as your as the title of your book suggests, and we both have it over our shoulder, which I, yeah, I love. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my book publicist made me do this because actually, <laughs> behind me, is more relevant to what else is going on. It's a picture of uh, some sailors in the Black Sea fleet in Odessa in Ukraine that I took a picture of back in the day in the Soviet Union. And my publicist said, why isn't your book there? I said, it's not really a bookshelf. <laughs> I'll put the book there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, as the title of your book suggests, there's nothing for you here, finding opportunity in the 21st century. Your book covers diminishing opportunities, um, especially in certain regions and among certain demographics. And in the afterword of your, your book, you list all of these um, examples of things that people can do from all different walks of life um, to increase opportunities for the less advantaged. And I was hoping that you could highlight some of those things that, that steps that people can take and, and how um, other people increasing opportunities for you helped you in your own life. Yeah, well, thank you so much for been asking about this because, uh, you know, as in, in part, as you pointed out, the book is um, a memoir um, about my own journey from basically a coal mining town in the Northeast of England um, which took me, you know, in a rather unexpected uh, journey to uh, the uh, the White House uh, in terms of, you know, working there. I've called some of that from the coal house to the White House. And it's in many respects a kind of improbable journey as growing up as the daughter of a coal miner who had left school at 14 uh, to go and work in the coal mines with no qualifications whatsoever. And I was the first in my family, first generation uh, to go to college, like so many other people. And I'm sure, you know, many of the people, you know, watching this have, um, had this experience and you know the, the I, I use the memoir as a kind of a, um, a vehicle uh, to uh, then explain a much larger uh, set of issues related to the rise of populism in the United States which you know really uh, fed into all of the events around the 2016 election and the election of uh, Donald Trump and also the rise of populism in the United Kingdom and also in Russia um, I argue that Putin is the first populist president of the 21st century. And we can talk about that as we go along. And part of that is a, is a factor in what's happening today in Ukraine. And then, the, you know, the third part of the book is really about how do we find antidotes to populism, uh, which is really kind of going back to the, the issues that you just talked about there, which is expanding opportunity uh, for people. You know, it's a particular focus on the United States and, and places that have been left behind, uh, particularly since the 1980s and the kind of a period of, dislocation and deindustrialization 
as, as a result of the massive changes we've had in American manufacturing, the changes in the kind of global economy and the kind of shifts of manufacturing away from the United States to places like China, especially after join, China joins the WTO or you know, generally overseas. And the way that so many places, particularly in you know, what we now call the Rust Belt, which of course is the American heartland, used to be the manufacturing heartland, uh, have got left behind in terms of the economic development places like California and the Bay Area where you are or you know some of the other places Dallas Texas you know where we have kind of colleagues and you know uh, broader um, areas of uh, the, the the various coasts as well where you know we've we've really seen you know the economy thrive and many people adapt to changing circumstances but lots of parts of the country being left behind you know we think back to 2016 and the electoral outcome uh, the the vote uh, or the vote itself was decided, and this is obviously the um, issues that you deal with, you know, on a daily uh, basis within the League of Women Voters, by seventy thousand votes, um, give or take, in three counties in three states, and the distinctions of those three counties in those three states, but they were all states where people really kind of felt that they were disadvantaged, left out of you know, broader developments, where there was quite a bit of uh, um, uh, economic deprivation as a result of uh, you know, many things, but also the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, there hadn't really been a recovery, all old manufacturing areas, but also places at a demographic uh, tipping point. And you know, the reason I use my personal story is because that was my life experience. I grew up in one of those places. So I was born in 1965, and just at that point when I was born, the coal mines in my area started to close down, uh, partly again because of these big shifts in the global economy. And um, all of the industry in my area had been nationalized after World War II, including the coal mines. They were not private mines. So what happened in World War II was the British economy was devastated by the war. It had been cut off for five years, and the government had to step in to build up the big commanding heights of industry again, the heavy industry and the big mass manufacturing. So you had the auto works were run by the country, you had this you know, um, auto manufacturing, British Leyland, everything a British in front of it, British coal, British steel, <laughs> British shipbuilding, British rail, um, you know, the power generation, it was all run by the state. And of course, as a result, it obviously wasn't very well managed at times and it was heavily subsidized. And so British coal had hit the skids um, by the time I was born. And my father was in and out of jobs as one coal mine closed, he would go on uh, to another. And these were all very small mines, you know, with very um, small number of, uh, of miners there. And, you know, they were all based on villages. And these villages, that was the whole main stair of their economy. And by the time, you know, I get into my teens in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher's come along, 1979. And, you know, just like Ronald Reagan in the United States embarks on this massive uh, pe uh, period of economic reform of um, privatizing the nationalized industries in this case, uh, trying to um, introduce more automation, more modernization, more um, uh, up to date uh, ma uh, management techniques. And there's no longer the same demand for manual labor. My father had no qualifications. Um, you know, like many other people in my hometown that all worked in as manual laborers or in these um, uh, nationalized industries and suddenly there was mass unemployment with people with having no qualifications and skills to go into something else and no ability to move because a lot of people lived in public housing. So my father, um, you know, in the period after the mines closed becomes a porter in a hospital, an auxiliary or ancillary worker you know, the lowest economic rung on the ladder. And so my family were plunged into poverty. He'd actually had a reasonably good wage as a minor. His identity was all tied up in this. And everybody had this feeling of dislocation. And the title of the book comes from something my dad said to me in 1984 as I was leaving school. And at that point, Britain was in the throes, not just of a large unemployment crisis, but one specifically focused on youth, which is very familiar, right, today as well. 90% of kids leaving school in the United Kingdom and in the early 1980s, going through into the mid 1980s, had nothing else to go on to, not immediately, because there was such a, a dearth of jobs, it would take them a long time to find something. There were very limited places at university or college, um, or even in vocational schools and apprenticeships. And especially for someone like me, the places that would be paid for were very limited. My local education authority, just like the Pell Grants in the United States and state funding that you have for state schools, would pay, you know, if I was good enough to go to college. but you know, for the vast majority of people, that wasn't going to happen. When it came to like elite schools, only about five or 6% of kids leaving school would go to one. Now I had that opportunity. And my father basically said to me, if that happens, if you get to college and you get it paid for, there's nothing for you here. 
you know, when you've got your qualification, you're just going to have to go and find a job somewhere else. You won't be able to come back. And, you know, I had this very deep conversation with him and that, you know, was the problem. All of my areas, you know, like the place I grew up in, similar areas in the United States got hollowed out. There was a brain drain. You know, if people could get an education, go somewhere else, they did, they went. There was nothing for them there. They didn't come back and it kept perpetuating the problem. And how that fits into the kind of um, political um, uh, you know, scene is that people then don't see themselves represented in um, you know, political and economic elites or education elites and academics. They lose those kind of connections. People are not going back to the regions and bring back new skills and revitalizing them. And the uh, point of the end of the book is to say all the things that we actually could do to change this because I didn't make it just because of my own abilities. I made it because an awful lot of people helped me. It wasn't just my local education authority who paid for my education, but I had money from the Rotary Club. I had money from the equivalents of small grants of the League of Women Voters, women who were, you know, it was the Women's Institute, women who were very active um, in our local, um, you know, town. There were usually professional women, the handful of professional women they were, or the wives of, you know, kind of, the mayor or other you know local dignitaries but they were very keen on trying to give something back to the broader community and i'd get a small grant i'd get assistance um you know with um a, a study um uh, uh, and exchanges um at every point somebody helped me and what i was trying to lay out at the end of the book is ways in which we can help overcome these barriers to opportunity and you know in a way revitalize our communities and re-engage so that there is something for people here. And because I do believe it's also politically imperative because the grievances that have festered in places that have been left behind and people who feel dislocated and disassociated have led to the kind of polarization that we see in America today that is really damaging our democracy. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, how that the polarization might be changed by what is currently going on um, in, in Ukraine. So um, Russia's war on Ukraine has effectively united the Western nations um, against, you know, it's the against a common enemy thing. And I'm wondering how, what your thoughts are on how that might bolster the American democracy and maybe alleviate some of even the polarization within our country. Yeah, there's different ways of looking at this. I mean, if we think about, you know, during the Cold War, of course, we did have that common enemy perception, right, that really kind of rallied people around and, you know, tended to put some of the debates we've been having today in a very different light. You know, people thought twice about trashing fellow Americans, you know, abroad or, you know, that that partisan infighting might lead to a national security crisis because there was the Soviet Union, there was this idea of a, a system challenge and that, you know, kind of our own freedoms needed protecting. And, you know, I think we've kind of lost sight of that somewhat, you know, obviously over the last 30 years since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I don't think having a common enemy again is the best of approach, actually. But I think, you know, what we can illustrate, what, what was illustrated by this conflict is how fragile, you know, our democracy and the freedoms that we take for granted can be. Because Ukraine is like us. It's like the United States. It's kind of a messy democracy. It's horizontal. Everybody in Ukraine thinks that they can be president, just like in the United States. And many times people think they can be president. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of constant change. You've had a lot of churn. You've had a lot of political infighting. There's all kinds of things going on in Ukraine. But Ukrainians, um, you know, for all of the beefs that they had about, you know, their, their government, they want to be citizens of their own country. They want to be you know, free and not, you know, basically repressed and in, uh, you know, subjugated to uh, this kind of vertical of power that you see this autocratic authoritarian system you have in Russia. So many people were already leaving Russia to live in Ukraine, you know, for example, prior to uh, the invasion, not because, you know, they're particularly um, you know, thrilled or enamored by whatever prime minister in, um, or president might be in power in Ukraine, but more because of just there was a just, just different feeling in Ukraine, a feeling that you could be yourself and, you know, do you want what you wanted to do, irrespective of, you know, the uh, perhaps sometimes flawed um, system of governance. Whereas in Russia, there's this very much sense that people are subjects of the state you know, under the iron grip of the Kremlin and, you know, there's the repression of uh, free speech in the media that we've seen increasingly um, over time. And so, you know, what we've got here is a, is a study in contrast. 
you know, we're all saying here that, you know, uh, Ukraine has been invaded because it's a democracy. I mean, in part, that's true. But it's because, you know, basically in Ukraine, there was an alternative way of doing things that is, uh, in many respects, anti antithetical to how Putin and the Kremlin, you know, want to run Russia. Now, there's a much broader set of issues uh, at stake here as well. What we're seeing in um, uh, this invasion of Ukraine is a post-imperial, post-colonial grab. It would be as if, you know, Britain came back and tried to, you know, take the United States back into the British Empire, which in fact it did try to do you know, to some degree back in 1812. You know, there was various wars there as well. Or if Britain reinvaded Ireland and, you know, tried to take it back because of all the disputes over Northern Ireland, for example. So there's a different, you know, set of stories there. But fundamentally, this should be a kind of a wake up call to us that, you know, in many respects, democracy is fragile, that there are, you know, c countries and entities out there that, um, you know, want to subvert it. We've already seen um, Putin and the Kremlin make a decision to intervene in our um, elections in 2016 uh, to try to manipulate uh, public opinion and, you know, to uh, make us lose faith in our democracy. And then, you know, there's not um, much of a big step away from that than Putin basically making a decision to invade a neighbouring country that wants to go in its own direction to quash its democracy, uh, to quash its freedom of choice and to um, basically teach um, people a lesson. And I do think, you know, what you said there about unity is very important too, because for too much of the last several years, we've a politicized foreign policy and national security. I mean, that was really the essence of the impeachment hearings, the ones that I, the first impeachment hearings that I took part in. The idea that um, President Trump would ask a foreign leader for a personal political favor and would really um, try to use foreign policy and national security for his own personal advantage, just basically stay in power and subvert, you know, the American democratic uh, procedures. I mean, it's really kind of astounding. But in a way, that also fed into what was happening here because uh, it, it, that trivialized the whole engagement with Ukraine at a time when it was already the subject of uh, Russian aggression and made it very clear to Putin, at least, that, you know, this, that particular American president, uh, President Trump, thought of Ukraine as just an object to be manipulated as a plaything and that the United States was not really serious you know, about the defense of many of the values and principles that it was um, espousing. And he believes um, that, you know, the United States has lost the plot, that, you know, we're very weak, uh, that we're disunited. And he actually, that was part of his miscalculation in going into um, invade Ukraine. He didn't think that we would have collective action to push back. You talked a little bit about um, the sort of disinformation and the, the efforts that that Russia put forth um, to influence elections in the United States. Um, I'm wondering if that, um, and I, you know, I know that's a huge thing in Russia is controlling that sort of the, the information that gets out to the public. Um, I'm wondering if that's something that is all blunted by current US sanctions, both from the government and from tech companies and things like that, um, so that Russia may have less of an influence um, with its propaganda machine. I think all of us have woken up right here in particular to the impact of Russian propaganda. Um, you know, we now um, are more attentive to what Russia Today, RT and Sputnik Radio have been doing. We now know, you know, about the way that the Russians manipulated Facebook, Twitter and uh, you know, everyone's familiar now with Russian bots and you know, fake personas on the internet and social media. But, you know, in many respects, what Russia did in 2016 was what it's always been doing. And in the Soviet period as well, it's kind of a classic influence operation, Cold War style, Cold War style propaganda. But it really took off because of social media. And, you know, for, for things that we've been doing ourselves, you know, so part of the way that we have blunted and the only way that we can continue to blunt in the future, Russia's efforts internally here are different from what's happening inside of Russia, is to be just more mindful ourselves about our own, you know, um, uh, internet hygiene, you know, and, uh, you know, making sure that we have two, three 
factor authentication in our emails because one of the big things of course the russians also did was be able to penetrate the email um uh, systems of the dnc of course and also of um, key political figures like hillary clinton and others and you know those releases of that information to you know wikipedia you know for example and that had of course a pretty negative effect in the in the politics stirring things up you know um re um tweeting and uh, amplifying discord um that's already kind of out there on the internet you know being very careful about what you're reading you know looking to make sure that you know what the source is before you you know uh, press send to you know forward it on to your aunt to your friend or you know your cousin this kind of thing is also pretty important but you know so that we get more savvy ourselves about um you know how we understand information information literacy you know getting back to that in schools and you know kind of really kind of thinking about the media and information environment in which we operate but when we look at russia itself it's it's very difficult for us to penetrate um that um iron dome of propaganda and restriction of information that russia has created now prior to the last few years russia had a very different approach to um, china which has you know the great chinese firewall uh, of information literally blocking information Russia didn't do that, so the Kremlin didn't do that. They created their own content, which is, you know, what they did, you know, here in the United States as well, pushing out content and, you know, having people pretending to be Americans to push out content. But now they are going for the full censorship, trying to block. You know, so we're now thinking about going back to old school, um, you know, type of methods as well, shortwave radio, though I don't know whether many Russians today know what a shortwave radio is. You know, if you've got your, can you get shortwave radio on your iPhone? You know, I don't know, can you? Uh, you know, so that's kind of a bit problematic. You know, the old Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, you know, kind of um, approach to things that we used to have during the Cold War, those kinds of things might not work. So as you're saying, there's quite a lot of thinking now and out there in the digital sector, probably you know, near where you are in California, people think, thinking, well, how can we penetrate that? You know, how do you um, have contact with the Russian people? Our war is not and, uh, of information is not with the Russian people in that sense. It's going to be the Kremlin and this kind of information war is being directed by, you know, Vladimir Putin. We want to still figure out how we can engage with uh, the Russians. But, you know, right now, because of that propaganda, the Russian population is still generally supportive of what they think is a special op uh, military operation, not a war. They think the, the fault of all of this is the United States and NATO and, you know, perhaps the European Union. It's the West. They um, are rallying around Putin and he has, you know, got uh, basically um, a massive advantage on of, his, of time. He's been at this, you know, kind of propaganda game, talking down the United States, pushing out disinformation for a considerable period of time. For the best part of his entire presidency, I mean, he is an operative. He's, you know, uh, he's trained in these dark arts of, um, you know, the kind of espionage and politics. He lies as a matter of course as part of his job. I mean, this was, was you know, what he did for a living, <laughs> lying as a as an operative in um, the um, security services, and um, you know. Uh, it, it's taken us some time, I think, to fully process the kind of person, the kind of system that we've been dealing with in Russia. And so now it is really going to be able to take, it's going to take quite a lot of effort to be able to have any influence on the information space in Russia that would, you know, turn things in a positive direction. I think we can have more impact at home by continuing to try to blunt the effect of Russian propaganda and to try to also um, you know, reduce some of the old polarization and, you know, partisan infighting that we have here as well. But that's also going to take some effort. We've seen images. I mean, you talked about the Russian people have uh, are getting a different message than what we know to be reality. We've seen you know, media coverage of huge pro pro um, Russia rallies that are in favor of the um, what's going on in, on in Ukraine from their perspective. Um, and, but on the other side, we've also seen coverage of people getting arrested in the streets, holding, you know, holding the blank signs. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you have insight into how much influence the people have. I mean, obviously Putin cares because he's putting out the, the disinformation, um, but how much popular support does he need to continue doing what he's doing and does he have it um and is there like is there any potential of tipping the scale in the other direction you know it's a really great question and you know that um there is some potential there but it's going to again you know as i said before take some effort there's several factors to bear in mind about 
this sort of structural problem that we have to contend with in Russia. <clears throat> First of all, Vladimir Putin doesn't really have any checks and balances on him. So the presidency is guaranteed by the constitution and that's about it. Uh, you know, he has the full, you know, sort of legitimacy in the constitution. I mean, in theory, you know, he has to, and in practice, he has to put himself up for re-election as president. And the next presidential election is 2024, which is pretty close, right? I mean, you know, God knows how that's going to play out in this context. And he has the right now, because of amendments he made to the constitution in 2020, to run for two more six-year terms, because the terms were, ex were changed and when Dmitry Medvedev, his close associate, stepped in for him for president. So they went from four years to six years. So we could be president until 2036, you know, by which time he'll be in his 80s and he'll have been the longest serving, um, you know, basically Russian leader in modern history, longer than Stalin, who was there for about 30 years, give or take. The other um, thing is that there's no political party system that props Putin up, so there's no check on him in that way. You know, if you think about the United Kingdom, where Margaret Thatcher was removed by her own party. Um, in, in Russia, Putin isn't a member of a party. Uh, the United Russia Party that people hear about as the ruling party, he's not the head of it. It's just a kind of a movement in favour of him. You know, so the Russian parliament is more of a rubber stamp. It doesn't have any uh, check on his authority. And in terms of his popularity, as you spoke to there, it's important for him. But, you know, that can be also manipulated because Vladimir Putin's become kind of the symbol of the state. He's become entwined after 22 years. The people around him say there's no Russia without Putin. There's no Putin without Russia. You know, these two things, the state and Putin are one and the same. You know, he describes himself as the head of state, the commander of the state. And in a way, he's sort of stepped in to the same position as the as the czars in the um, in imperial period and the general secretaries of the uh, Communist Party in the Soviet period. So he's kind of fit right into that kind of model of an autocratic power, you know, one leader, you know, charismatic leader in uh, the Russian political system. Now, the people do have a say, and this gets to the heart of, you know, your problem that you were outlining there as well in the question. Uh, they get a chance to, um, you know, vote an election, but then there's no, no opposition. It really becomes a referendum on Putin or, you know, how you think of Putin is what you thought about Putin in the past. The last presidential election, the opposition figure who ran ahead of him, I say opposition in inverted commas, was a woman named Ksenia Sobchak, who happens to be reputedly his goddaughter, maybe, and who was the um, the daughter, in any case, of um, his former law professor at Leningrad State University and his former boss, who was the mayor of um, St. Petersburg. You know, so this is somebody who he's known their entire life. So the idea that they were really an opposition figure is pretty farcical. And this time, the real opposition to Putin, somebody who could have been a contender is, of course, Alexei Navalny, who was first they attempted to assassinate him with Novichok, a, um, basically a banned weapons grade nerd agent. When that didn't work, they've put him in a penal colony. They keep extending the terms that he's in um, uh, incarceration, uh, basically to keep him well out of contention for the elections. And they've um, you know, basically decapitated and then rolled back his entire political movement. And they've gone after all of the independent uh, non-governmental organizations, the watchdog agencies like Memorial or Memorial uh, that um, was looking over the kind of the sins of the Soviet past, the Soldiers' Mothers Committee, uh, which emerged out of conflict in Chechnya in the 1990s and was trying to keep uh, the government accountable on issues related to war and peace and the treatment of conscripts in the military. All of these groups that had some impact have been uh, moved away. And then the other factor is that 60% of the Russian population or the Russian workforce work for the state one way or another in the bureaucracy or in state um, uh, run enterprises, you know, manufacturing industries, for example. And so when you look at Putin's popularity and it, you know, it tends to uh, be coterminous with the people who work for the state about, you know, 60% of people at least because they're vested in this system. And then it's all the people who watch television. And so it's, you know, really hard to say, you know, what, what would be the percentage of people who would be really willing to sort of step up and push for something different? And we're seeing tens of thousands of people now leave Russia, those who just don't want to be part of this. We are seeing, as you said, protesters, but what Putin and the Kremlin have become very good at is making sure that they get rid of any organized opposition. So yes, you could see a lot of demonstrations and protests, you're seeing mass um, arrests of people, even if they get released later. But the whole point is to head this off. So for something to happen, it, I think it's going to take quite a bit of time. Now, there could be a shock to the system. Something could happen to Putin. You know, he 
isn't as young as he used to be. Admittedly, he's only 69. He's about to be 70 in October. But things happen. And, you know, that this um, he's the wild card now, him himself in this system politically. It's very fragile and quite brittle. And, you know, things can go wrong. But at the same time, he could also be there for a very long time. Speaking of Putin, <laughs> Um, based on what you know about him, what do you think are the likely outcomes of his attacks in Ukraine and, and his willingness to potentially use nuclear weapons? He's willing to be very brutal and ruthless. He's already shown it. He's shown it all the way through his entire um, career um, from when he came into power in the 1990s and 1999. He presided over uh, a war in Chechnya and the, the south of Russia, which was extraordinarily brutal. I mean, this is part of Russia that had attempted to secede and they leveled uh, the capital city, Grozny, and uh, assassinated the other um, leaders and eventually imposed uh, a leadership on Chechnya. Uh, headed by Ramzan Kadyrov, a person who's pretty notorious, who has personal fealty for Putin, and who you know he's actually uh, using to deploy against the Ukrainians in this um, invasion. The forces of Kadyrov, the Kadyrovtsi, are out and about in Ukraine right now. Um, you know, uh, carrying out atrocities and uh, you know brutally um, brutal urban fighting. And um, you know, basically, uh, what Putin has shown that is, if there's uh, an instrument, he wants to figure out how to use it. During the Soviet period, uh, the P Soviet Union also had battlefield nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, as well as um, intermediate nuclear missiles and um, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and they had biological and chemical weapons. You know, so in a way, Russia's just reviving under Putin. You know, some of the same um, instruments and in the arsenal that they had previously. They've already used, and he's already used polonium, um, uh, basically a nuclear um, material, by poisoning Alexander Litvinenko in London and turning him into a dirty bomb, a human bomb, um, and spreading polonium all the way around London. They've used Novichok not just against um, Alexei Navalny, smearing it in his underpants of all things, but by be putting it on the doorknob of another former Russian spy, Sergei Skripal. Uh, and poisoning him and his daughter and actually killing a British woman, uh, Don Sturgis, in the British uh, town of Salisbury, where, you know, they uh, had enough Novichok in a perfume bottle to kill several thousand people and a totally brazen attack. So the point is that Vladimir Putin likes shock and awe. He likes a demonstration effect. He wants to intimidate and scare everyone. So he's talking about using nuclear weapons because he wants to terrify us and intimidate us with the purpose of getting everyone else to back down and negotiate away Ukraine and give in to his other demands. So we have to be very clear about why he's doing this. And absolutely, he is contemplating trying to figure out if he thinks it's necessary, how he might use a nuclear weapon. Again, he's already put it there on the table and we have to push back and in the diplomatic forum in particular, to basically make it clear that this is impermissible because this would cross a threshold of nuclear use that would put the non-proliferation uh, treaty regime under in complete jeopardy and would also cross a line that we said, you know, was closed off after World War II and our own bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, Putin's always throwing it back at us, well, you do this and you do that, but we've made it very clear that we wouldn't contemplate using a nuclear weapon in that kind of circumstance that he is for demonstration effect, you know, to escalate the situation so everybody else will will pull back. And we have to get out there, talk to the other nuclear powers, you know, make it very clear in the international arena that this is impermissible to put pressure on Putin to step back from this kinds of threats. Even the threat itself is, um, you know, sufficient to cross the line because we have North Korea already engaging in nuclear blackmail by um, developing missiles and make it very clear that, you know, they might intend to hit the US mainland, you know, maybe hit with a missile as far as here as Washington, DC. So it's not just Putin and also Iran. You know, we're close to um, trying to reconclude again uh, a form of the um, previous Iran agreement um, to constrain their nuclear weapons program because of worries about um, Iran engaging in nuclear blackmail. So Putin would make the world, you know, pretty uh, safe and nuclear blackmailers. Um, if he continues, um, not just um, in terms of uh, the actual usage, but to com continue to talk about this, it's making it very clear that there is, you know, one set of rules for countries with nuclear weapons and one set of rules uh, for those without. And that would probably, of course, when you think about it, lead to so many more countries wanting to get hold of some form of nuclear weapon. 
so um, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine had been looming for a while, and we know that the U.S. had intelligence about it. What could the U.S. and the European Union have done better, and what can they do now, um, given where they currently stand? Well, I think one thing that was very smart, um, you didn't quite ask that question, but you know, <laughs> one thing that was very smart was actually revealing that intelligence on the part of the United States. Because often when I was in those positions, I felt very much constrained by that we knew the Russians were up to things, but we couldn't basically talk about it or we were restricted from talking about it. You know, when it came to example, the poisoning of Sergei Skripal, um, you know, or, or Alexander Litvinenko before it, I mean, people knew that of course Putin had given the okay to poison Litvinenko, but they, they you know, were saying probably maybe instead of revealing the fact that they knew it. And so Theresa May, the then Prime Minister of um, Britain, made a huge decision um, after the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter and the death of a British um, woman, Dawn Surge, who picked up the um, perfume bottle totally by accident, not knowing at all what it was, that she would name it and shame it and tell everybody that the Russians had used Novichok. This um, compound that, you know, most people, nerve agent, that most people didn't even know existed, it was so highly classified. The Russians were quite surprised by that. And it actually showed that you could get ahead of it. We didn't exactly shame them. They don't really show a lot of shame. And they were trolling everyone and saying, well, that was the UK did this and others did this. And, you know, just like when MH17, the Malaysian Airlines was shot down, they were saying the CIA did it, others did it. You know, they, they were always going to push back, but it had a big impact in rallying others around. And, and sort of showing to um, other our allies and other partners what the um, Russians were capable about. Because one of the problems that we've been having right from the very beginning is bringing other countries along. This is what we could have done better. We should have engaged, you know, more closely with other countries ahead of time on the information that we were seeing. I mean, obviously, the United States government start trying to get ahead of it, you know, several months ago, talking about an imminent um, invasion. But, you know, in the lead up to that, they weren't quite as assiduous as you know as they could have been of keeping their eye on the ball, you know, trying to um, get everyone um, you know rallied around, you know, because there was initially the hope that um, you know Putin and Russia could be basically pushed off to one side because of course the administration came in worried obviously about COVID, about China, climate change. They had a different agenda, and they were kind of hoping that they might be able to you know deal with Russia, sort of deflect them. And that was really kind of what they could have done better. They could have been much more focused on this as a near-term threat because the pattern of threat from Russia was apparent. Even under the um, Trump administration as well, that's when you had that poisoning of Sergei Skripal, the use of Novichok. You had you know, the um, uh, use of paramilitary forces uh, in Syria, um, the, the Wagner group who fired on American special forces in a covert operation pretending to be rebels you know, in Syria even though we had these rule of, rules of engagement um, with the official military and hundreds of them were killed and injured in the firefight with American special forces. That was a really you know, terrible moment. The Russians were aiding and abetting um, Bashar al-Assad in uh, basically the levelling of Syria you know, to keep himself in power. There was the use of chlorine and mustard gas and other chemical weapons there that we suspected you know so there was all kinds of things that were happening there and you know we we were constantly getting diverted onto onto other issues i think there's been a longer um you know thread of us um you know not focusing on russia as the you know the problem it was i mean i thought we needed more diplomacy honestly and more of a concentrated focus on russia engaging not that it would have headed this off necessarily but we would have been more attentive to what they were doing we could have passed on messages you know, you can't pass a message if you don't meet with them. Sometimes, you know, you can't get it. It's not just through clandestine methods. You need to have these, you know, one on one meetings to basically figure out what are they trying to tell you? What are they trying to spin here? You know, what's kind of going on? How are they articulating these issues? How can we push back on things? But we kept on, you know, kind of diminishing the problem that Russia was instead of keeping focused on the handling. So for the future, what we have to do is keep focused. We have to um, maintain the unity with our allies and partners and we, we can't lose, you know, the ball because this is like one thing when you don't look, they'll hit you in the face. And that's exactly what happened with this invasion. You know, as you said, there was a long pattern. You know, we knew that Russia was reacting very negatively to issues like NATO enlargement, to all kinds of interactions, you know, with Ukraine. They had Ukraine in the crosshairs, they had Ukraine in the crosshairs even before Putin. And that there was then this kind of pattern of ruthlessness and we should have factored all that in and you know, dealt with it head on and had a strategy, a coherent strategy that went from administration to administration. 
Can you talk a little bit about who has influence over Putin? We have one specific question about Putin's relationship with Yuri Kovalchuk. Kovalchuk, yes, Kovalchuk. one of the oligarchs, yeah. Um, but I'm I'm curious about that specifically, and in general, like who has influence over him, and who could change what he is currently up to in Ukraine. I think it's more what could change, you know, rather than who. Perhaps it's more about is he thwarted, headed off, you know, kind of at the pass <laughs> on on different issues, and really can't press his objectives. So a lot of it depends on our diplomacy, you know, our ability to get other countries that are so caught far sitting on the fence or see this as some just spat and dust up, like during the Cold War between, you know, Russia and the United States, and don't really actually see this for what it is as a much greater threat uh, to them as well, because it sets a precedent for any country that has a territorial dispute with its neighbor and a preponderance of power and maybe nuclear weapons you know to basically move on in and you know um i mean basically we have to uh, be able to figure out how to reframe things but also to help ukraine withstand this you know so there's th those kinds of things of you know make making it very difficult for russia to press ahead with its military objectives uh the um pressure on the economy um you know basically um, continuing to make it very difficult, you know, for um, Russia to get the components that it needs for its military industrial complex, or, you know, for, um, you know, Russia to have the sort of freedom of maneuver, that's going to be difficult because, you know, there's still many other countries that are still willing to trade with Russia that won't um, join in the sanctions. There's the whole issues of Russian oil and gas, it's actually very difficult to wean, you know, countries away from that in the short term, maybe medium to long term. Yes, absolutely. It's going to take a lot of hard work. But in terms of individuals, you know, just like the question about people like Yuri Kovalchuk, yes, Yuri Kovalchuk is an oligarch, you know, a business person, but who's somebody who Putin's known for best part of his life, you know, to going back to his youth. There are an awful lot of people who have enriched themselves in the system because of their close proximity to Putin, and he's one of them. And he shares Putin's mindset. I mean, the other people are the people immediately around him. This war was plotted, literally plotted, with a very small group of people, maybe three people, five people, you know, in addition to Putin. It was clear that not, not everybody was in on the in the decision. But all of the people in and around the Kremlin are vested in this system. You know, so for them, they rise and fall with Putin. Putin goes, they go as well. They're part of that system. And, you know, he would likely be um, in a state of emergency with a war going on, replaced by another hardliner if he was to go. Uh, you know, kind of others who don't want to lose their positions either. So uh, the way of influence is really of them kind of having to recalculate. They've seen that the goals are not achievable. The thing is, right now, Putin still thinks the goals are achievable. It's just he has to do them differently. So he's adapting. And he is willing to be brutal. He is not being put off here by the... Um, the casualties. Now, it appears by some recent reports, I mean, again, the US deciding to reveal intelligence, I just saw this today, that he may be getting, um, you know, false information. People are scared to tell him, look, I mean, he's been cut off. I have the same experience myself. You know, um, people got scared to tell Trump stuff in particular, or people never even got the chance to take information to him. So he wasn't getting accurate information about things. And it seems that, you know, people were censoring themselves and not telling Putin stuff. And so, you know, Putin may still think lots of things are achievable, but he certainly always knows that plans don't always come to fruition. But and you have to adapt your strategy. He's a contingency planner. If not A, then B, then C, then D and E. That's, of course, where some of the nastier aspects of things come in, because he's always going to try to figure out how he can generally achieve his goals. And, you know, until somebody tells him, hey, you're not going to be able to, but then there's the shoot the messenger problem, um, you know, he's not going to really shift. You know, so when people like President Macron in France went and said, look, you know, you're not succeeding, that's not what he thinks or knows. So, you know, does that information come back to him? Does somebody tell him, look, you know, the economy can't keep up with this, but, you know, the rubles leveled out now. You know, there's still people buying Russian oil and gas up there at a premium. Does it become clear that the population won't support it all because they're not as resilient and um, willing to put up with um, suffering as they were in the past? This is a different Russia. 22 years of Russians living their best lives. Does he eventually care about the brain drain? I mean, all of these are questions and it depends on how he's assessing things. And again, he's in a bubble. And part of it, I think he is, has a lot of faith in his own genius and his own infallibility until 
you know, he sees differently. But then, you know, someone like Putin, he can't accept failure. He can't accept losing. And so he's going to try to find a way of making this a win. What do you think the United States relationship should be now with Russia or if and when we get out of the current crisis in Ukraine? Well, there's a difference between Russia and Russians and Putin and the Kremlin, mm -hmm. the people who were there in that system. In respect to the fact that I said, you know, 60% of the population there, you know, would have kind of vested in the system one way or another. But this isn't this isn't the Russian people's war. They didn't make this decision. They had no say in it. I mean, again, because of the structures that I already outlined, this is one man's war and one man's choice, you know, perhaps in, you know, cahoots with a very small number of people. But this wasn't you know, something that there was a, a great deal of um, discussion about. In fact, I would say most Russians, you know, couldn't even believe that this happened. I mean, every Russian that I talked to said, no, this is not going to happen. Of course, he's not going to invade. You guys are idiots, you know, for thinking this. Complete idiots. You have no idea, you know, he's just manipulating you. He's playing you. He's got you exactly where he wants us, which he actually did. I mean, Putin was never so powerful as the day before he decided to go in because he really did have people focused and trying to figure out how to head this off. And then once he did it, he's got everybody fighting back. You know, so this is, you know, quite problematic, right? I mean, it's, um, you know, a very difficult uh, situation that we all find ourselves in. And, you know, what we have to do is then start to think about, OK, the long term. I mean, Biden's already said, gosh, you know, can this guy really stay in power? Look, he might. It just like Assad in Syria, he might still be there years, years into the future. In 2012, we said Assad must go. He's 2022, he's still here. And so, you know, we have to start thinking about contingencies for what do we do if Putin's still there? You know, it gets back to one of the questions that you asked before about how can you engage with the Russians and the Russian people in these kinds of circumstances, communicate with them. But then we also have to have a sort of strategy about how we would re-engage with Russia and bring, you know, kind of Russia back into European security and kind of global affairs, you know, the way that frankly we had to do with Germany after World War II or Japan, you know, under a different set of circumstances. And then we have to have a really you know, kind of um, harsh look at our own, um, you know, positions on this, you know, and what we really want to do here. We, we have to make sure that we don't leave Russia out in the cold. You know, we have to kind of counteract the um, possibility of this happening again. I mean, look what happened with Germany, World War One. you know, kind of uh, led to World War Two, because, you know, Germany was punished and, you know, the German people, and then you went, you know, have the rise of reactionary leaders as a result of it. And then, you know, kind of World War Two. We could have figured out how we would reincorporate Germany, reincorporate Germany into Europe. Now it was a divided Germany, but we're going to have to start really thinking long and hard here about what do we do with, as you said, Russia, not with Putin and you know the Kremlin and the, that regime around him, but Russia and Russians. What kind of Russia, you know, do we want to see in the future? How do we rebuild those relationships and make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again? And and, and that's that's a tough decision. How do we start thinking about European security? or, you know, kind of a larger, you know, security frameworks. If President Trump or somebody like President Trump um, were elected in the United States, do you think it could take the United States into a similar type situation where the rules keep changing and, and that person remains in power well beyond what the um, voters initially expected? Look, what we saw with the both impeachment trials and the reasons for them, first of all, trying to you know get rid of the opposition um, opponent by, you know, getting uh, Ukrainians to, you know, somehow be, you know, kind of involved in opening up investigations for the person who was, you know, likely to be his main opposition figure. And of course, is the president today. And then the events of January 6, everything around that, you know, everything that we're learning about the efforts uh, to um, subvert the electoral process. You know, absolutely, we would be on that path. If President Trump gets re-elected on the basis of the things that he's done already, we're on that path. Because, you know, he will then have proven that you can manipulate the institutions, that you can, you know, basically stand for uh, election on the back of a lie. I mean, he said that he um, won the 2020 election. He continues to say that. And, you know, to try to, you know, kind of manipulate uh, the institutions and the systems. And look, this is kind of already, I, I wrote in the book, that Russia is the ghost of Christmas future for the United States, because it shows what happens 
when you get put too much power in one man and when you personalize your presidency and you get rid of the checks and balances our checks and balances in our systems work to a point but there was the manipulation of um the republican party in the congress you know the people who still after the events of january 6 came uh, forward and challenged the electoral votes and have continued to do so and have continued to say that Biden didn't win the election, although they haven't said that outright, but continue to, you know, basically suggest that uh, Trump won, even though they know that was not the case, and to therefore put the whole question of our electoral system um, on on the table. We are already in a constitutional crisis. You know, you have in Putin a person who has no checks and balances. There's no party behind him. He just has the legitimacy of his popularity and the popular vote and the support of, in an unthinking and critical way, of a movement, the dominant party in the Russian Duma. You also have the manipulation of the media, and we've had that in the United States as well. President Trump manipulated Facebook and Twitter. Um, he had his own preferential media, and he pushed back against media that criticised him, calling it the enemy of the people. That's what Putin does as well. You know, So we're already in that space. This is not about ideology. It's not about you know, kind of the Republican Party per se and the Democratic Party or conservatism and progressivism. This is about one man trying to seize power. And that's what's happened in Russia. Putin got rid of, of all of the checks and balances in the system. He amended the constitution. He had other people do it for him, of course, uh, to stay in power indefinitely. And Trump tried to do the same thing in the US system. He tried to get the vice president to refuse uh, to certify the electoral college votes. And that would have plenty got very close, apparently, according to some of the preliminary stuff we hear from the January 6 committee, to pulling that off and to throwing the whole um, election into question. And so that is where we've been heading on a very dangerous path. And so, I mean, we really require shoring up the checks and balances in our system, you know, making sure that we have a properly functioning two party system. That's very dangerous for the United States where we have one party that seems to be, you know, turning into a charismatic personality cult and, and basically being more interested in subverting the system rather than, you know, in um, up upholding the system. And there was a lot of pressure put on the judiciary, on the courts, you know, on the Department of Justice efforts to subvert the military that didn't happen, but certainly, you know, kind of um, all of these efforts on suppressing the vote, gerrymandering I mean, is, a, is a perpetual problem on both sides, but, you know, stacking a secretaries of states and the whole electoral system, making it very difficult for people to vote. I mean, all of this is putting our democracy at risk. So yes, there's a long way of saying, yes, absolutely, I agree with you. <laughs> this would be, or at least with the thrust of that question, rather it was you, you know, specifically, but the, the thrust of that question that then that, yes, we would be um, in big trouble. I'm sorry, I don't know whether this was, um, um, you could hear this behind the door, but my dog was scratching to get in the whole time. I thought it. I thought it sounded like an unhappy dog. It's not. Very, it's not very loud. I was uh, trying to pretend it wasn't happening. You know, so it's, <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I actually walked off, wondering, you know, why I didn't let it in. But, yeah. <laughs> um, so we only have a couple minutes left, and I like to end all of our programs with one final question which is what is the most important concrete step that each of us can take to protect our democracy? Well, I mean, in terms of um, the League of Women Voters, it's basically making sure that people have the opportunity to vote. So, um, you know, engaging with um, representatives uh, because, you know, part of the problem that we have right now is people don't feel represented. We've got into this um, stage of a lot of performance politics and also where many people believe that the only people that we represent is the people that they can specifically say voted for them. That's not the essence of our democracy. So holding people to account, you know, each of us can do that. We can hold our representatives to account. We can do that at the state and local government as a, a level as well, not just in the federal government. But we can all be actively engaged in making sure that people have the opportunity to vote. I mean, that is the one um, act of citizenship that all of us can engage in. And it, and it doesn't matter how you vote or how you choose to vote, but just that whole act of um, being able to vote and ensuring that people have a chance to vote. And, you know, to really become active in our own states and local governments to make sure that that is done in the most objective and non-partisan uh, way possible. 
Thank you so much for all of your incredibly thoughtful insights. Um, I am very grateful to you, Dr. Fiona Hill, for taking time to be with us today. I really appreciate it. And I also want to give a special thank you to Jennifer Trainer, who spent a lot of time. She's one of our program co-chairs and she spent a ton of time and energy getting us ready for today's event. Um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Please feel free to share the YouTube link of the recording with friends and family. Uh, consider subscribing to our YouTube, YouTube channel um, for easy access to future events and becoming a member of your local League of Women Voters. This officially ends our program. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs>